identity. So we're going to just get started. Um, I want to begin by just letting you know what my thoughts were uh, for this session. Uh, in the morning uh, plenary, I presented a lot of information. And I, I think what's going to be helpful is, is to kind of uh, move from that background on a, to a more practical level. Uh, there are many questions that many of you, I'm sure, have uh, in the day-to-day -day interactions and, and experiences. And so I want this to be interactive, uh, and, and you're going to help to guide our conversation uh, this afternoon uh, with your questions. Uh, and there are certain areas that I'm very much aware of in speaking with other people people where the questions are and we didn't have the time uh, to cover. Uh, Laura has graciously agreed uh, to also uh, share a little bit more uh, in detail uh, uh, about her uh, journey. And uh, I'm sure there's there's more that we haven't uh, yet heard. And I, I want to you know focus this in on what's most helpful to all of you uh, and recognizing that each of you has a different place, a different perspective, um, and, and maybe some different questions. Um, and we can adapt that um, as necessary. So again, I, I'm going to encourage you throughout this session uh, to feel um, invited to ask questions uh, for clarification. Um, but I'm just going to uh, begin uh, by um, acknowledging uh, that this is a difficult area. And, and again, as I said this morning, you know, to be able to, to enter into that dialogue um, and be able to empower you with things that I've learned over the years, um, the way I like to phrase it is is that you know we're very well intentioned we want to help people um, not everything we do truly helps um, and in fact unfortunately some things can actually be harmful um, if we don't recognize it with the best of intentions so um, there's also the the way of uh, in your workplaces and and your colleagues uh, navigating uh, the ideological agenda and how you can remain relevant in the conversation we touched on that very briefly in one of the questions um, and I'll give you a little bit of, of what I've learned over the years as well um, so with that brief introduction what would the, my plan is is to allow Laura to come up and and share with you a little bit more uh, about her journey. Uh, and then I'll give a, a very brief uh, kind of presentation of, of maybe many of you have asked the question, how did I get here? <laughs> um, and, and maybe it'll inspire you in, in whatever the Lord is calling you to do. And it's just been, you know, for all of us, I, I think, um, have, have had a journey uh, to get where we're at. Uh, but then we'll open it up to questions. So I'm going to turn it over to, to Laura. And uh, do you have a micro? Does anybody know? The one over there, there. Okay, so I'll let you go. Okay, so um, I want to talk a little bit about what um, some things that I went through and um, a little more what the journey was like. And you know, um, mostly it was a living hell, to be honest. Um, I don't think people really understand when these kids are talking about how wonderful it is and how happy they are. And we used to say the exact same thing. Uh, and we would, we would always tell everybody, oh, I'm so glad I did this, I'm so happy. But when we got around um, the people that we were in groups with, we were actually the support group that I went to. Um, a few months into it, I was dating another transgender. He was a male to female. And uh, a few months in, we stopped going to the group, and we said, this is the most depressing thing in the world. We're leaving more depressed when we leave than when we got here. And we thought, well, it's just those particular people. They just, they don't have it all together. You know, they, they haven't figured out all their issues. They have so many issues. We don't have issues like that. This is just who we are, you know, and we just, um, so we were just going to go live our own life. But the reality was there, there was a lot of depression. And I was very, um, you know, the, in a sense... I was happier because I wasn't in all the pain I was in before. It's like taking a drug. It did relieve it, but it didn't ultimately fix the problem. And so um, I was just continually craving this drug of affirmation, anything I could do to make it real. And so um, as, I took the, as I took the hormones and those begin to make little changes, and it's, it's weird the things that it will change in the body, and it gives you this sense of it being real. So uh, things like um, my jawline begin to change a little bit. My, um, my hips begin to narrow. Um, the facial hair and body hair and all, you know, you, you get hair you don't want. And, um, but as, I, as these little changes were starting to, uh, to show themselves, you know, it's like it, it gives you this false sense of, 
wow, this is really happening. And you realize it's all fake, but then it's like, but it's going to be real one day. And a lot of people don't realize either what the, um, the chess binders are doing to these young girls. I, I had, um, now there are different types. I had a chess binder that was um, this very, very tight fitted shirt. And because I didn't want my partner, now he knew I was trans, obviously, but I didn't want him to see me with breasts before my surgery. And so I just wore these 24 seven. The only time I ever took them off was to shower. And so my, I started having horrific back problems because my back never moved for two years um, because it just kept it completely stiff and frozen. I still have back trouble to this day. Um, some girls have cracked ribs, some have popped lungs. These are very, very dangerous to be doing this. Um, and a lot of girls don't realize this and they have handed these things out at pride events for teens. So these are, like people just don't realize the incredible dangers there are with all of this. It is not, um, no matter what happiness, temporary happiness it seems to be bringing, and like I said, it does a little bit because it's, it's relieving pain. It's like, taking, it's like taking any kind of drug. But we wouldn't, if our, if our kid was wanting to take heroin because it made him feel better for a little while, we wouldn't encourage them to do that. We wouldn't celebrate that because we know the long-term effects. And it's, it's kind, of the same, kind of the same principle. And there were so many other things along the way that people just don't think about. Um, I... Um, as, especially early on in the transition, when everybody knew I was trans, I wasn't as worried about being found out. But as I began to transition more and more, I was living as if I was just a male. I was eventually legally male after my chest surgery. And I was you know, using men's restrooms and uh, locker rooms and things like that. And so there was no, um, nobody knew that I was trans. And especially back then. Now, these days people might question a little more, I don't know. Um, because it's so prevalent in our society. Back then, most people hadn't even heard of transgender, and so nobody was really questioning. And I remember just times I was so afraid, like at the gym, and I kept thinking, like, what if these men find out that I'm in their locker room or in the bathroom? Or one of my biggest fears, especially toward the end, when I really was passing as male full time, and I thought, what if I'm wrongly accused of a crime and I go to prison? And that, that absolutely terrified me. I thought, would they put me in the men's prison or the women's prison? Because I was legally male. Um, but especially in, the, um, in the, the men's locker room, there were just so many fears about changing and all that. And um, the guys always changed in this open area, you know, and I, I just wasn't able to do that. And so it, it caused so much fear and anxiety all the time. And as I was, um, but I, as I was going down this journey, I remember uh, the, one of the first things, actually, to back up just a little bit, uh, before I started the hormones, I had to go to a licensed therapist, and um, I really had no interest fell in going. It was what you mentioned earlier, the WPATH standards. Um, according to that, you were supposed to go to three one-hour sessions, then you would get diagnosed with gender identity disorder. And so I thought, um, well, that's what I need to do in order to start this journey. So I had no interest in counseling. I did not think my mind needed any help. It was just the body that was the problem. So I was just kind of mindlessly answering the questions, just getting through these three sessions I had to have. And in the third session, she put down her notebook. She stopped for a second, and it's like she just looked right in my eyes, and she said, wow, you really have issues with your mom. And I was stunned. I was like, whoa, wait, how did we get from talking about me being a man to talking about my mother? And I was so angry, and I blew up at her. I said, I'm not here to talk about my mom. And he said, or she said, so you're just here for this diagnosis. I said, well, yes. I was like, duh. I thought, like, I thought you knew this. I was told if I came here, I would get this diagnosis because she was known as being one that would help transgender people. So she's, um, but I think she knew that that's where a lot of my problems had started. Now, again, I don't blame my mother. I, you know, God has given me so much understanding as to what she went through. But at the time, I had this deep, deep, bitter hatred of her. And so as... Um, I think she knew that that's where part of the problem was. But because of pressure, because of the politics, for whatever reason, I don't know, she said, okay. And she just gave me what I wanted and gave me the hormones, sent me on my way for nine years. You know, and all these surgeries, all the hormones, the, the stuff, you know, that this did to my body. Um, when I think she could have helped. I don't know if I would have listened, but I, I wish she would have at least tried. 
Um, I really didn't even, even then, I really didn't see that connection. I was just angry and didn't want to talk about her, but I really didn't see the connection until years later. You know, I wish she would have at least tried. But as far as, you know, and the hormones, and um, I had to, it kept making, um, I think you mentioned like the, the increased red blood cell count. And my, my blood was getting so thick. At one point, they were, um, they were afraid I was going to have a stroke. And they said, so they sent me, I had to go to have therapeutic blood withdrawals to thin out the blood. Um, they would take a pint of blood, like, I was supposed to go every, every month, I think. Um, but I ended up not going a lot. It was inconvenient. It was across town. And I was always like, nothing's going to happen to me. I'm fine. I think it's such a miracle that, um, that I'm alive and that I've come through all of this because um, my, my uh, iron or my red blood cell counts were just off the chart. Um, and I didn't like going. But God, through this whole thing, he was drawing me in so many ways. He was speaking to my heart. And just I was having dreams all the time. I was always thinking about <laughs> Um, um, just constantly aware that this was not real, but constantly trying to override it. And I think that's why so many of them become extremely, extremely narcissistic and self, not only self-centered in a selfish way, but just like really their entire world revolves around um, self and this identity just 24 seven. It's all I thought about. Um, everything was about affirming this identity and just became quite neurotic because I couldn't um, even having a normal conversation with somebody I was so terrified to meet people because the whole time all I could think was do they know do they believe that I'm a man have they, do they have they figured it out and it was just driving me absolutely insane and and little things began to bother me and I thought am I um, do my clothes look right on me um, do I have the right style or you know and we uh, my partner and I would notice little things and it was like oh you're, you're, you're doing your belt the wrong way. Men wear it, you know, buckle it this way or whatever. Or, you know, just we, little things. It was like every little thing had to be just right. And we didn't, you know, I just was driving myself absolutely insane trying to make all this real. But the real battle it really didn't, you know, they're always d saying that society is the problem. It's the parents' problem because they're not affirming us. But that, that affirmation was never, ever enough. It didn't matter. My, I had some family members that affirmed me and some that didn't. And it didn't matter. I didn't want to be around any of them. Because just being around them reminded me of the truth of who I was. And I was desperate to get away with it. I had, re, I had completely reinvented myself. So I couldn't stay um, with my family and be around them and be reminded of who I was. And I remember just the most awkward conversations. You know, we'd be, uh, I went on one vacation with them. I really wasn't around them a whole lot, but I went on one vacation with them. And I remember in the middle of it going, uh, uh, they were talking about some stories and stuff from childhood and all this, and we're just laughing and having a good time, and all of a sudden they all go, <gasps> look at me, like, wait a minute, how are we going to, well, okay, we're not supposed to say she and all this, and at least my, my brother and my sister-in-law and some others. So they were very, you know, kind of tiptoeing around. My parents never did affirm me. They never used the male pronouns. They never called me Jake. And I was so angry at the time, but honestly... I am so thankful they, um, they stood for truth. They, I knew they loved me. I would tell them how hateful they were being because I was trying to manipulate them into doing what I wanted. I knew they loved me. But it didn't matter because, um, I mean, it, it matters from, uh, from their standpoint. But for me, like I said, I had family members that affirmed me and some that didn't. But it was just never enough. It didn't override the truth that I knew. And that's what Romans 1 talks about, how they suppress the truth in unrighteousness. I was suppressing the truth all day long. And so, um, but my parents stood for truth. They kept praying for me. And that whole time, my parents were being so transformed as they sought the Lord. And I still remember, I'll never forget how uh, my mom and dad always, I always felt like they were trying to pull me toward themselves. And they were just trying to cling on to me and not let me go. And it was just driving me crazy. I felt so smothered by my parents. But there was a point where they really turned around and it was like they began to pursue Christ. And as they did, it was such a testimony to me. I could see freedom in them I'd never seen before. Because when they were pursuing me, there was such bondage in that and they were worried and fretting about me 24-7. But as they began to pursue Christ, there began to be a freedom and a peace in them I'd never seen. And so the Lord transformed them over the years. And not only, not only were they... Um, they transformed just for their own relationship with Christ, but they were so much more prepared to receive me back home. You know, if the, pro if the father of the prodigal son 
had himself become a prodigal and chased after the son and lived, you know, in his world. And like, I, I know even Christian parents that have gone to gay bars with their son. And, you know, if the, but if the father had become a prodigal son, where would the son have gone when he woke up in the pig pen? We can't, we have got to remain firm on the truth. And love does not, is not always going to be called love by the world. Jesus said, woe to you when all men speak well of you. He said we'd be hated for his name. Um, and, you know, he was not only a loving person, he was the very source of love himself. And they nailed him to a cross. So sometimes um, these kids will, will scream at their parents and tell them how unloving they're being. God alone is your judge. He knows whether you're being loving or not or whoever this is in your life. Um, but there is a way, like you talked about earlier, one of my favorite things, you, you really touched on this, was asking a lot of questions. These kids are so desperate to be listened to. They feel like nobody listens to them, nobody understands them. Asking a lot of questions, letting them tell their own story and their own feelings, helping them wrestle through that. And a lot of times they will come to some good conclusions, um, but then you can, you can insert truth as you're listening to them. Um, but I think that's really one of the best places to start. And, but really, honestly, this was... This was all a work of the Holy Spirit as God was transforming me over the years and having me listening to, like I said earlier, listening to conservative talk radio of all things. My parents had no clue. They, God did things that they could have never orchestrated. And so whoever it is in your life, this really is a work of the Holy Spirit. Don't forget that and just keep praying and keep, keep loving them like God leads you to love them and don't let the enemy define what love is supposed to look like. I don't want you to go too far because I want to involve you in the, in, in the, the question and answer part of, of this as well. Um, you know, this, is, this is so helpful. I mean, anything that I can say, you know, um, is, is, is in comparison to what you've experienced. Um, what I'd like to add, you know, to what, what you've already heard um, are things that I've heard repeatedly from, from families and, and other individuals that are affected um, by this. And then maybe broaden it a little bit into, um, you know, if you're not directly involved in, in a conversation like this, uh, of, of what to say and what not to say. And, and to, to really reinforce what Laura has, has said, you know, I think that um, unconditional love, I think, is absolutely essential. And, and I think that that's something that, uh, yeah, that would be, thank you. Uh, <laughs> we should have been prepared for that. Um, unconditional love. And, and, and not saying that, but, but to, to have that be um, a reality. Um, and I think that where uh, an individual is struggling with, they need to know um, that, that that love is unconditional, meaning that as much as, as one uh, wishes for them to, to see the reality of what's going on, um, it was very helpful in Laura's sharing, you know, that, that you know, the mistake that I have often gotten into is like, I've got all these facts. I've got all this, you know, this science here. Why won't you listen to this? And, and most people at, at that point of their lives are they're not ready to hear that. Um, it doesn't mean anything at all to them. But to know that that you love them means a tremendous amount, even if they 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 reject it. it there, there's something there that they will be able to come back to when they're ready. OK, um, but the other part of love it's not a free for all. It's not, you know, you, you, you can't love somebody by, by accepting untruth. So what I have found in talking to families that have experienced this situation, that, you know, the question will come up, you know, my, my son, my daughter um, is having this uh, challenge right now. What do I do as a parent? Okay, so number one, I love you. I love you unconditionally. I will never not love you no matter what, period. Okay, then, you know, that, that uh, they, you know, it's been shared that, that, here are the boundaries. This is what, what I can accept. This is what I can't accept. It's not going to make them happy by any means at all, but they will respect that more of knowing where those boundaries are. And you think as a parent, that makes perfect sense, right? You, you don't let kids touch hot stoves and, you know, we don't let our, our you know, our, our kindergartners smoke cigarettes and, you know, th we, we set things up because we love them. Um, and I think that even includes the question of how you talk to them. So that if, 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 it's, if it's this um, 
I mean, adolescence is a difficult time for all kids in, in many areas of childhood where the parent is telling the child no, and the child is saying, I want to do this, I want to do this. Um, but setting those boundaries. So even in, in the, in the um, you know, how we dialogue, you know, do you accept using pronouns that they prefer or, or their, their name? And I think if you, you spell it out very clearly, I, I can't accept that and this is why, and I know you don't like this, but this is what we're going to, you know, to do to be able to navigate that. Um, you, you maintain that relationship so when they are ready, when they have that experience, when something else happens, that that bond has been left there. The hardest thing is when, when um, you know, the people that are affected are, are really intentionally, they move away and you don't even have that uh, sphere of influence to help them or they don't know that they can come back um, when they really need it. So that, that I found to be very, very helpful. Um, we already talked about questions, um, asking questions and, and trying to inquire. And I think that the part of that that I really, really loved, you know, is, is that to realize that this is their experience. Okay, it, it, it's it's something that that is real as they're experiencing it, and and to acknowledge that and actually try to enter into that, um, you know, that you may not agree with it, but you need to understand. They need to see that 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 you understand that you. And again, this never works if you're doing it with a checklist and saying this is what I'm told. You have to really, really be entering into it with a sincere desire, you know, to understand the experience. Um, you know, I mentioned, and the other thing I want to uh, dispel, you know, that a lot of it, I, I worry a little bit when I talk about strained family relationships, um, and there are many, and I you had this experience with your mother, and it's very, very common. It's not universal. And I know many families, um, you know, where the parents uh, do everything they possibly can. Many times parents don't see how their children, you know, respond, you know, to that love. Um, and many times it's built upon a lie. Um, but you said that, that the parents are completely oblivious to this. Sometimes there really is, there are issues that have gone on and it may not be with the parents themselves. It could be with another family member. It could be with a, a peer. Um, and because, and, and really to understand that it's so, um, diverse as far as what people's experiences are. Um, you know, another piece of advice is, is that to be involved um, with your children's lives. Um, that um, you know, our technology and our world is set up, you know, where, where many of our youth are, are spending time on, on social media, um, they're in their bedrooms, on their computer, by themselves with the door locked. Um, and, and there's actually data, there's scientific data, you know, about uh, family time. Um, just eating dinner together in the evening has a tremendous, uh, you know, benefit as far as um, you know where where, where children go. Children go, so it doesn't have to be you know spending hours and in, in doing all sorts of things, but but to be uh, aware and intentional in in um, in that family dynamic. The other uh, last period uh, piece of advice that I want, want to share with you uh, from all, my own personal experience. It seems like very often in this whole discussion, we're always on the defensive. We're also trying to address the ideology and, and counteract that. And what's often missing is proclaiming the beauty of human sexuality and not just proclaiming it, but living it. Okay, so that that um, and and you talk to uh, you know families that um, it's it's the most powerful thing in, in the world that that even if a child is is being influenced by their peers, um, when you're modeling um, love and and recognizing we're all broken and and nobody has a perfect family or perfect relationship, um, but but emphasizing the beauty and and that will will maybe just plant a seed for the future. Um, and, and, you know, allow somebody to see as, as they journey through, as, as you experience, you know, that, that not, I mean, people often will double down, you know, you, you, you enter into something and well, this didn't quite work. Well, I'll try even harder and I'll go further down that road. And until you get to the point where essentially you hit rock bottom or, you know, something happens, you have a, an experience with the Lord that, 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 that really turns the, the light bulb on, but, but you've got someplace uh, to go to. Um, to home, and I, I, it, it's so strong. And so, you know, proclaiming the beauty uh, of our our sexed being uh, in relationships and in, in our culture, it's so become so countercultural. Um, but it's so essential and it is so beautiful. So I'm going to stop there um, and uh, open this up 
uh, to questions that you might have. Um, and it's a small enough group, you can just uh, you know, raise your hand or just uh, jump in there. Um, we can continue to, to dialogue together if you'd like, but I wanna really make this a conversation and uh, address specific things that, that you might um, have encountered or things that you'd like some, some our, our thoughts on. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, well, the surgeries are, and first of all, they don't offer, especially for females, um, they're neither option that they, that they offer is, is anything close to what would be considered real. And they, um, basically, in the one I was looking at, they take part of the forearm muscle and uh, they create a phallus, but it has to be, artificially inflated, they have to extend their urethra, which is one of the biggest problems. This is where they have lots of urological problems, um, lots of leaking, lots of um, fissures and different things. Um, I, I've, read, I've read a lot of stories, and I actually think they're hiding a lot of the, the evidence. It's really hard to find, but if you start digging, there are a lot of just horror stories out there. Um, I've also heard of ones where the tissue just starts dying um, and just like I said, uh, one, one girl I know that was in a wheelchair. But the, <clears throat> one of the biggest ones, actually, and this girl that I know that has had um, 31 corrective surgeries, now she was, um, um, most of the time, she creates these really, really positive videos. And she talks about how amazing this is and how wonderful it is. She had one video that I found. Um, I actually downloaded, so I have the evidence, and I'm glad because she took the video off. It's no longer on her YouTube channel but I've got the original. And she got on there and she, she said, you know, I just gotta be really honest. I, this is hard and this is not what it was supposed to be and this is going on and this is going on and I've had so many corrective surgeries and this is having to go again and again. And I just saw a more recent video, she's having to go for another corrective surgery again. And uh, at the very end of the video, she says, I wish I had never taken that first shot of testosterone. But yeah, she goes back and makes all these positive videos. And one of the reasons she said, she, she wants to be really encouraging and really positive for everybody else because they believe it's who they are and they can't change. So the only solution is trans transition. So they don't wanna be negative. They want to be really positive for everybody. And that's why you see so many people talking about how amazing and wonderful this is, but behind closed doors, we used to tell, we would tell everybody how happy we were, but behind closed doors, we would always say, we wouldn't wish this on our worst enemy. You know, the one way to think about it is, is you're actually, um, you know, creating a wound. Um, and, and so, um, and, you know, if you think about surgeons are always, um, you know, of the, of the mindset of, about what we can accomplish. And they don't always think through the uh, ramifications of that. So they're from a very practical standpoint. And, and the issues of, of, which isn't really spoken about, um, of how it influences uh, sexual experience, the ability to achieve an orgasm, uh, the, uh, the actual ability to engage in sexual relations. Now, the... Um, Fortunately, the, the, the number that actually go through what we call bottom surgery is a smaller percentage. The much more common surgery is the top surgery, uh, the bilateral mastectomy. Um, that's changing as, as people are trying to, you know, advertise and, and do this. And, and um, there, there is a whole industry that's developed about uh, being creative. There's a whole, if you look through the literature, um, there's dozens upon dozens of studies being published about more creative ways to create that wound. Um, and um, with no better results. And so, uh, you know, it, it, it's, it reflects that, that they recognize that they're not fixing the problem and the surgeons themselves are doubling down trying to figure out ways that they can, they can do this better. And they're, they're looking at a cosmetic effect. But um, so, so the reality, of, you know, I think people get very uncomfortable even within uh, the affirmative community when you start getting into specifics and describing in detail um, what actually occurs. It, you know, it's easy to think about this in, a, in an abstract way and, and, you know, and then being portraying that this is, this is great. Um, but the reality is, is uh, that you're taking 
you know, normal functioning, you know, uh, uh, sexual organs and essentially destroying them. Uh, and in the process of, of creating all of these, these difficulties that people experience and um, it's uh, your logic function, the ability to, to urinate, um, uh, infection risk, uh, and, uh, and then the, the lack of the, the intended goal of actually having something that, that we're, and it, it makes, you know, from an objective standpoint, you can see why it, why it doesn't work. I, uh, Patrick Lappard, who's a plastic surgeon um, who I've worked with, um, is very good about describing this in, in very understandable language. And, you know, he, he, he uses an analogy, I think, that's, that's really helpful, even though we're, you know, we're talking about bottom surgeries. He says it's the equivalent of, of somebody that has um, brown eyes and they want to have green eyes. And, and the solution to that is to, to pluck out your eyeball and put an artificial eye, you know, eyeball in. You know, to, 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 to achieve that desire, you've you completely destroyed the normal function for that desire, you know, to have that appearance. Um, and, you know, again, it, you know, it's, it's uncomfortable, you know, to, to talk about this, but I think it's necessary. But thank you for the question. Yes. Yeah, so, well, Laura, can, you can describe very personally. I can talk in general, but maybe I'll let you yeah. share that. So. Well, and I never had bottom surgery, so I couldn't on that. But um, I can talk about um, the... Um, God has really... Honestly, I'm amazed because I didn't know what to do. I'd had horrible experiences with hormones. So just in my personal case, um, God has just regulated my hormones. I'm in um, at least perfect balance for a postmenopausal woman. Um, and I've taken no female hormones. I've stopped the, the male hormones a long time ago. Um, and I'm just now, um, you know, I've been going through electrolysis. So some of these things I've had um, to do um, externally or, you know, but God has been doing some of it just miraculously. Like they told me my voice would never change, that it would be permanently lower. Um, but it's almost back to its original. Um, and I'm actually, um, I'm actually getting my breast surgery in uh, about a month, uh, July 7th. So... I'm really excited to have that restored. Wow. That's been a gift from God. Um, but yeah, other than that, like I, I don't know the details of reversing bottom. So, so the, in general, um, when the hormonal, the cross-sex hormones are being introduced, they're, they're usually introduced gradually and you, you ramp yourself up to a full dose. Um, we do that for kids that have pubertal abnormalities as well. Um, that doesn't universally happen. So if you go to some, yeah, so, so if you go to, um, uh, that's, that's the recommendations now, in, um, but it's, it's quite variable. Um, the general recommendation, and again, I don't know if this is what your experience is, is to not just stop cold turkey because that, that can have very, very significant mood changes. Um, you know, very, very significant. If you think about, um, you know, just, uh, uh, you know, the normal changes that are, uh, you know, postpartum, you know, depression is a great example of rapid fluctuations in, in, in hormone levels that lead to very uh, significant uh, psychological uh, distress. Um, but there's a whole industry that's now uh, evolving. Uh, the surgeons are, are engaged in, in the enterprise of, of doing the affirmative surgeries and now a new uh, uh, reversal uh, industry is developing as well. Um, so the, the reality is that they're not able to restore normal function once it's been impaired so that, that you're not going to get that back again. Um, so so, um, so much of what, ha and then once the gonads have been removed, um, you know, that um, there's, there's importance when in younger uh, individuals where, where those hormone levels are, are essential, especially when we're talking about um, adolescents um, in, in, in their early 20s, the very importance of estrogen and, and bone mineral metabolism and, and uh, making sure that they're not having risk of osteoporosis later in life. And so um, there's often a need to begin replacing hormones, um, appropriate levels of hormones, similar to what one would in minister to somebody that if they didn't have normal gonadal function from, from birth or, or because of another illness. Um, but it, um, the science actually is not, I mean, just as we, we've said that, that it's not established uh, for uh, all of this affirmation approach, it's even more rudimentary in, in, in an organized way of how to handle the detransitioning process, because many in the medical establishment want to pretend like it doesn't exist. Um, and the reality is it does. So um, we're, we're starting to see a little bit more coming out on that and we're going to see a little bit more. Uh, this, the, the Christian Medical and Dental Association, the CMDA, has been tasked with, with um, trying to provide some recommendations about how we might propose to be able to do that and be able to look at the effects of how we can support people in that. I think throughout all of this, and I don't know, you know your experience of, of even with 
um, you know, the, the, you know, having the, um, uh, the, the, the detransitioning, um, the, the role of psychological support and being able to have counseling available um, just because there are so many issues involved with that um, can be tremendously helpful. The challenge is finding a provider that's going to provide truly help, help, you know, helpful solutions. Um, but there, there's, there's many people experience tremendous benefit in being able to finally get you know, some of these uh, issues that, that are, are deep seated, even when you've come back, you know, and understand this didn't work, um, there are all of these wounds that, that need to be repaired. I don't know if you had any. Yeah, I mean, definitely. And I didn't, um, I didn't have counseling right away. It wasn't until I went to First Stone Ministries um, as a staff member about three years later and began to really get some deeper healing. Um, so that definitely had a tremendous benefit. And I thought I was totally healed by that point. They wanted me to go through their Living Waters program. And I was like, I don't really need this because I'm, I'm healed now and I'm good. And <laughs> it just totally wrecked me. I had, I had so much deep-seated um, things and trauma and all these wounds. And so God really began to clean a lot of that out. Um, but I, I was also going to say on the, um, when I started detransitioning, there, nobody knew what detransition was. It wasn't a thing really. I mean, I know now there were other transgenders that transitioned many years ago. Um, but at the time I didn't hardly know any, I mean, all I knew was, um, just to stop living that lifestyle. And you're right. I, I stopped cold Turkey. I had them. I don't even know. I've had a lot of health problems in my life already. So I can't say this was exactly that, but I know after I stopped the, uh, the testosterone, I had the most horrific headaches I've ever had in my life for probably a couple of months of just, I, there were so many nights I thought I was going to die because they were um, just horrific headaches. And I would just curl up in a fetal position trying to get any comfort. No amount of medicine was helping. I was on all kinds of painkillers. Um, and I just wanted to, it, it was terrible. So um, yeah, I definitely don't recommend just getting off cold turkey, <laughs> but I, I just didn't know any better. And there were no resources. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the question is: is how common are disorders of sexual development with genital ambiguity? And and it's um, uh, zero point zero two percent. Um, so it's, uh, and that's why I, you know, I said 99.98% um, are, are, have normally formed and in, in, in functioning uh, genitalia. Um, now people will group together in DSDs things that where there's no genital ambiguity, like uh, the, the situation of congenital adrenal hyperplasia, um, and there are some like Turner syndrome and things like that that are relatively more common, but there's really in Kleinfelter syndrome. Um, so uh, Turner's, you're, you're missing one X chromosome, you have only one copy. Um, in, in Kleinfelters, you have two X chromosomes, but a Y chromosome. Um, those are, are respectively uh, unambiguously female and male, but they're often grouped in there to make the argument that it's more common. So it's a very, very rare uh, uh, set of conditions. And then when you look at the many different reasons for, for, for disorders of sexual development, um, you know, it gets even more rare. So that's where it, they're best served in, in a, in a academic you know, specialty center where, where you can have a multidisciplinary approach to help work uh, with that. Um, but um, it, it's more, um, you know, it, they do exist and, and they require, you know, lots of attention to, to how we can best help them out. Um, but the, um, uh, you know, the experience, you know, is, is very uncommon. Um, so, so I'm aware that there's lots of litigation going on currently where people are, are trying to uh, demand that the insurance companies pay for these types of surgeries. Um, so historically, they, they've not been well supported. And, and even if you don't have an ideological agenda, um, an insurance company will look at the data, the same data, the poor quality data, where they would make a determination there's not enough evidence to say that we should support this. Um, so um, until recent, there's actually, you can look on the internet and there's there's it's quite variable uh, for the the Medicaid uh, programs across the country and, and private payers that are willing to pay for this and so there's a push 
to put into uh, law legislation that they have to cover this. Um, and, and it's currently being litigated in a number of different states right now. Um, now, so that's the official rule. Um, but then there's ways that, that the medical establishment um, is really being dishonest. I mean, the, the way that they code diagnoses to be able to uh, get this to be done. So they're, they're clearly doing it for affirmation approaches. They, they often will code it in a way for another disorder um, that uh, will be covered. And, and this is happening fairly routinely um, within the medical establishment. Um, and uh, so that's, that's really it. So that's even uh, more uncharted territory. So um, again, many times it's being considered cosmetic surgery and many people, so what you're finding an explosion of people trying to get the transitions, that's why you, you have these GoFundMe sites. There's, there's probably a thousand or 2000 of, of these GoFundMe sites for individuals that are seeking to get funds to be able to support their transition. And I know a very few that are, are actually out there, you know, trying to get the funds for the detransition procedures. But um, we're, I mean, we're talking, you know, 10, 20, thousand dollars or more you know that we're talking about so yes Okay, so the question is is uh, getting to the the broader question of etiology or cause, um, and specifically uh, what is known or what is not known about the psychological um, aspects of that. Uh, the best I can say is that, that we have uh, hypotheses. We have, have uh, ways that we've proposed um, that, that may explain what's going on, um, but the definitive evidence is, is quite lacking. Um, so when I present the environmental influences, we can see associations. If we look at a broad enough uh, spectrum of, of in affected individuals, we will see patterns uh, that are clearly there. Um, patterns of, of prior um, physical, emotional, you know, sexual abuse. Um, the you know, uh, examples of of fa uh, parents going through divorce, for example, and and suddenly then the child becomes gender dysphoric around that time, uh, where the parents are playing off of each other. Um, you have the example of the autism autism uh, autism spectrum disorder, uh, where where people are are, are seeing this. Um, there's there's patterns where where children. Are are experiencing uh, depression or anxiety and self-harming behavior. And then they go into a psychiatric facility uh, because they're suicidal and then come out um, you know, saying, oh, we figured it out, I'm, I'm transgender, when there had been no evidence of that prior. And, and a lot of claims that are made and, and can't be substantiated, you know, that, that this, was a, um, this was present prior to that hospitalization and then it was just repressed and then it became out. Um, but there's actually very good data um, showing that, that uh, the number of people that had antecedent um, difficulties, um, depression, anxiety, um, you know, body dysmorphia uh, prior to having the gender dysphoria and, and leads to leading, you know, asking hypotheses um, if whether that's an attempt to explain that rather than a cause or an effect of that gender dysphoria. So there's there's much more that we, we don't really uh, fully understand. Um, and I think the challenge is that it's it's um, it's not a single answer. So that what's happening is that as we see this explosion, so I think there's a very distinct, when we look at, at the, um, the initial uh, diagnostic manual, um, it, it was an incidence of about one in 100,000 or 100, you know, very, very rare. Um, and, and now we're seeing, you know, people reporting, you know, uh, 0.5 or one or even two percent of the population that experiences this this gender dysphoria, and it's a very different group of people and likely different influences that are going on. So you have that those layers going on. Um, but I, I would say that looking at at some of the patterns um, that you see. Um, it, what it what appears, at least that you could state this as a hypothesis, is that many people have other issues that they, they assign gender as being the cause and the solution is to, is to undergo the affirmation. Um, and, and with 
very limited um, investigation, one could uncover those those uh, uh, you know factors uh, that are going on. So this is where, um, and and I think that that some of the you know that used to be with the the W path you were talking about the you know the checking the box and going through to get your psychological evaluation so you can get the diagnosis. Um, in the initial iterations of, of the, the, the approach, it was required to do that. And in fact, the earlier guidelines said that you had to exclude other reasons you know, for, for this that may not be related to gender dysphoria. And then um, it was felt that that, that was a barrier uh, to getting the hormones, uh, and uh, and so then it was de-emphasized, and then you know basically saying you don't need that at all. Um, that within a single visit you can check the boxes, and then you can go ahead and 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 you know get the treatment that you want. There's also. Um, very well reported. It's not a scientific study, but it, you know you can find this on on the internet very readily. That um, you know, gaming the system. You know, so so individuals can figure out what needs to be said to be able to get the hormones. And there are literally scripts of what you can read. And if you say, um, I've always felt transgender. I'm going to kill myself if I don't um, you know get trans you know uh, affirmed. Um, and then they get the, the prescription pad out and uh, write your prescription. I, I think it's it's. it's it's again, you know, this is I've heard this from, you know, personally from from a number of people as well. So um, I would say the best service that we could have from the medical profession profession is to is to acknowledge we don't fully understand what's going on. Um, it makes um, a lot of sense to spend more time uh, in the psychological assessment um, and um, in providing that that support. Even, you know, again, you think about the different models. Um, you, you can you can approach it as as well. I don't know what's going on here. I don't know how it's going to end in the end. But let's just see if there are other issues that we can address. You know that there are other underlying insults and and, and things that we might be able to help you with, even if we can't fix it. Okay, um, and um, you know that's often not met very enthusiastically, but I think that there are certainly providers. And I think, you know, to trying to find those providers is, is exceedingly difficult, and it's getting more and more difficult with the legal environment of, of attempts to, to ban uh, this type of intervention. So, um, but there, there are people that are willing to do that. I'm sorry, you've been raising your hand for quite a while. <laughs> no, no your, your colleague right behind you. No, no, you, uh, Jesus. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Do you want to start? Yeah, I, I think one of the, the best things, first of all, the church needs to be proactive in, um, in really teaching kids God's design, not just a, this is wrong and yes, teach that, but really proactive about God's design for male and female. But also in a relational sense, um, people that are gender dysphoric often have rejected their own sex for whatever reason, but there's a lot of times they don't feel like they fit in with their same sex. They feel like they don't measure up or whatever it might be. So, um, and they feel rejected by their own sex. And so little, girls so desperately need the, the love from other um, women, especially women that have not struggled with these issues, women that are very secure in their femininity. Um, one of the things that God did um, when I first came out of the lifestyle and I went back to church and um, I had some, uh, the, the church was just wonderful and so loving, but God brought uh, one particular woman into my life it was just, I mean, people that know her, she's just like the essence of femininity. And I was like, I didn't know what to do with this girl, but she was very intentional with me to treat me like a woman and to sort of draw that out in me, always inviting me to go do things with her and really treating me like a feminine girl rather than kind of tiptoeing around how comfortable I was going to be. She wasn't afraid to make me uncomfortable in a very loving way, and it was incredibly healing for me. Um, boys desperately need to feel like they fit in the world of men, to know that they're... Um, that they are young men, you know, and to be affirmed in that. So I, I think that is hugely missing. And there, there are so many kids that don't have good parents, or maybe they're just like me. Like, I, I had a good mother in a sense, but I didn't relate to her at all. We had such a terrible relationship. 
And so I, kids need good role models in the church and people that are willing to spend time with them, not just talk at them, but really include them and spend time with them. Yeah, very good. Yeah. Uh, well, the question about um, the, the male, uh, the feminizing surgeries um, are very similar, um, but in a different um, you know, direction there. So um, the, um, the same experience as, as far as uh, not uh, losing uh, sexual function, as far as, um, well, for, first off, you, you lose uh, reproductive potential um, when you have that. Um, but even, you know, the, uh, the ability to, um, to have sexual stimulation uh, is often impaired or completely abolished. Um, there are, are, what people don't talk about is, is, is some of the procedures that have to go on. And what, what you're doing is you're creating um, an invagination um, that, is, that is not really what what uh, of a female uh, a vagina um, and there, there's differences in, in infection risk um, and, and actually painful um, types of, of experiences with with attempts at, at, at intercourse um, so the same issues are there um, and the surgeries that are being done you know to try to, to manipulate that um, are just as wrought uh, with with difficulties um, it, you know it's a very risky surgery actually when you think about the techniques that are being used uh, to be able to do that um, and then once you've once you've uh, done that, the, the ability to restore that afterwards is is really gone. Uh, you, you're not going to have the ability to have that sensation uh, in the future. So I think it's very very similar to the the uh, the, uh, the female to male, male to female types of uh, surgeries. Yeah. Oh, so so the, from the hormone standpoint, um, I think that what we see is is that rapid shifts in in sex steroid hormone levels as a whole are going to have very significant effects on on mood, um, but it also is going to have effects on. Um, uh, other aspects of energy levels, sleep patterns, um, and, and so um, you're going to experience the same same effects um, in going off of that. The um, it was interesting, you know. I, I think you shared a little bit as, as as far as the the psychological effects of of being put on testosterone, and um, you know, increases libido. It gives you more energy. Um, you know, I mean, it has this euphoric effect, and the same thing that people report with estrogen. Actually, the people that report that are taking estrogen often will will talk about a calming influence. You know, they'll feel more at peace because, you know, they're, they're kind of more sedate with that. Um, and and um, and I think these are real effects that that they're experiencing and they interpret that as is a good thing. Um, but again, it's not not a healing um, uh, solution so that the underlying issues never go away. Um, and it's the same issue as far as uh, being weaned off um, for a detransitioner uh, to, to plan to do that on a gradual sense. If you think about um, the best example of that uh, from the, the female side is is um, going through normal menopause. I mean, the, uh, the, the males that are on estrogen will have similar types of experiences. So... Um, and, and uh, um, you know, when it's done very abruptly, if you take your gonads out and, and, and you're, you become hypogonadal, um, it's even more difficult. So um, I think the same recommendation, recommendations would apply. Yes, yeah, so go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> um, in our ministry in Minneapolis, I, I've got two situations just that I'm going to bring about one question. Um, quite a few years ago, I heard about a three or four year old boy who wanted to dress like a girl. And his Christian parents really supported that and then went to school. And the big lawsuit it was very public in the Kansas City area, uh, going back about 10 years ago. And um, so, on the other hand, about a month ago, we had another family come, and their 26 year old daughter wants to go through uh, the transition. Started taking hormones quite recently, like at age 25. And my question has to do with the age, uh, the age of taking uh, opposite sex hormones and the effect that it has on their body. For example, the 25 year old who started, I understand now, has a lot of physical pain because her body, her shoe size has increased three, three 
resizes in a year and a half or so. And so there's all these like uh, adolescent physical changes on the mature uh, female body. And, and there's problems with that. But do they have the same problem when they start the hormones as a, as a young child at age six? Okay, um, so the question is about the timing of, of, of the affirmation and, and specifically with related to the hormones. So first I should say that, that in the prepubertal um, stage, hormones are not part of that. So they don't really come into play until uh, the timing of normal puberty. The earliest uh, onset of normal puberty for, for uh, females is eight years, for boys it's nine years. So in the five, six age group, um, you're looking at specifically the social affirmation, which, which should include the wearing of dress and the pronoun usage and, and bathroom access and those types of issues. Um, there are differences, um, and um, one of the, the, the more striking differences is, is that when you start uh, early, uh, during interrupting normal puberty and then start the cross-sex hormones, that is going to be much more uh, damaging to the gonads. So that if the gonads are not allowed to mature as they normally would through puberty, you expose them to cross-sex hormones, the expected effect of that is going to be permanent sterility. Uh, if you start, if somebody has been allowed to develop um, uh, fully uh, mature and then they start uh, the cross-sex hormones afterwards, there's some reports of, of fertility being restored if they detransition. Depends on how long they've been on it. It doesn't guarantee that that will happen. Um, you know, I think it was mentioned earlier, you know, of, of when we're talking about androgen levels, um, in, in the females that are taking testosterone, um, we treat a condition known as polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is uh, a very high levels of androgens that are, are present. Uh, for the recognition of, of the medical risks associated with that, um, not only do they have very painful and difficult uh, menses, um, they can have effects on fertility, uh, but they also can have changes that are very adverse uh, as far as uh, heart disease risk. So uh, increased risk of heart attack, uh, blood pressure issues, um, diabetes, those types of things. And so we treat that in the medical profession to lower the androgen levels, um, to restore it uh, beyond that. When you're talking about the testosterone levels that are being, uh, that a, a female is, is receiving in the gender affirmation approach, it exceeds by far even what's seen in polycystic ovarian syndrome to the level that you would normally see in androgen secreting tumors. Um, so it's a very, very significant risk. You mentioned the, the, the increased red blood cells, um, which is just one example of that. And it's a very serious, it's a very serious side effect um, that can have a devastating consequences. It changes your blood lipid levels and, and changes your blood pressure. Um, so those things, um, some of them are going to be partially reversible. Um, some of them um, may not be. Um, you know, the, the uh, we call hirsutism, the, the development of the, the sexual hair uh, frequently won't go away. Um, and so we have to worry, be worried about that. Um, so the, so there's, there, there are differences when, when one's exposed to that, the doses that they're getting and for how long they're getting it that can influence uh, what is going on. Yeah. Uh, oh, first of all, what was your, she was trying to show us something, we can't read it. Oh, oh okay, okay, yeah, so okay. I knew she was trying to tell us something, but we couldn't read it. Okay. Um, yeah, I, think, I guess we're at the at the end of, of our, our scheduled time. Um, I would be happy to stick around for a few more minutes. I need to get to the airport uh, myself uh, soon. But if you've got some questions that, that we didn't get to, um, maybe we could spend a few minutes doing that. Um, I want to thank all of you for, for being here, your attention, your questions were outstanding. And um, thank you for this opportunity for us to have this conversation. Appreciate it. Thank you.